Okay, I think we're live, which is great. Um, everyone's not in, cameras are working. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, it's really great that we are part of RightsCon with our panel, which focuses on encryption. Um, I know it's been a long week already, so thanks for joining our Friday panel. And I'm going to give a brief overview introduction at the beginning people are probably still joining in. You can already see the three speakers um, uh, like around which we have built this panel. So we have a panel ahead of us that addresses the importance question mark of encrypted messaging apps. We also want to touch upon if these apps are politically relevant or they are not politically relevant. It's more for private matters. And um, if they are relevant, then for whom? for what activities, where around the world may be more important than elsewhere. Um, one aspect I hope we can also touch upon is an outlook. So what could be ahead for those apps? What could be ahead for encryption in general? Um, obviously, we are all aware that the Russian invasion of Ukraine really um, has put Telegram in particular into the spotlight. And in general, actually, as well, we've seen a lot of like policy responses having been triggered by this aggression um, by like several platforms actually reacted to that, including firms where encrypted messaging apps are part of their business. So Meta with WhatsApp or where the entire business is built around a chat app like Telegram. Um, and then there's a crunch question that probably you guys are all very well familiar with and that you find yourself confronted with very often when it comes to encrypted messaging apps or end-to-end -end encryption in general. Uh, so does their usage for good things overshadow the exploitation by dangerous actors or vice versa? I don't think we can offer a solution for this. I mean, maybe one of the panelists has a huge surprise and has our way out out of this quandary. But what I definitely can promise you is that we are going to hear inputs from people giving us different perspectives. Um, and there are four main questions that are guiding the session. Who designs, builds, and launches propaganda efforts, including mis- and disinformation campaigns, particularly on these apps? How do these propaganda efforts break through the more private interpersonal communication into public discourse, like more open social media or journalists picking the stuff up? And these two questions will be addressed by Zeli. And then Dima is focusing on how EMAs are used as important tools to organize activism and or potentially for social movements to form or to sustain themselves. And then we also want to touch upon content moderation, where Aza is really the best person to speak about this. Yeah, just the general like input on that, maybe talk about the different company structures behind it. Let's see how much time we have. And our three speakers addressing these questions are first uh, Zeli, who's a PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin. She's working with our propaganda research lab here who is kind of behind the session in terms of organizing. And Zeli has been leading some of our work on encrypted messaging apps. I think she'll say a bit more about this later. Um, she is a scholar in feminist studies as well. So she always brings a critical perspective into a lot of the things that we study, which is super valuable. And then Dima, Dima Samaro is a licensed lawyer and the MENA Regional Research and Representative at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. And before joining the Resource Center, she worked for Access Now, where she conducted policy analysis, um, specifically focusing on human rights issues that arise from emerging technologies. And then for the last question, we have Aza, Aza Al-Masri, who is also a PhD student and UT and a journalist and a digital security consultant. And she's worked extensively with independent media organizations, also individual journalism students, and especially across North Africa or also Western Asia to develop and support fact-checking projects. And I'm going to hand over really soon for Z to Zeli to kick us off. But quickly about myself, I'm the research manager of the Propaganda Research Lab. Um, we're based here at UT Austin, and I did my PhD at the Department of War Studies at King's College London. Um, since it's Friday and it's the last day of RightsCon, I'm sure you're all very well familiar 
with how it works, but we should have the live chat function. So people who dialed in, feel free to introduce yourselves there or connect via this chat and obviously post questions throughout the session. Um, and we will pick them up later in our like Q&A part. We should have presentations, we should have polls, and then we should have enough time for Q&A. So we're also looking forward to hearing from you guys who joined the session. But I think, Sally, you can kick us up. Thank you, Inga. I am um, going to go ahead and share my screen. We'll see how it goes. And then if it doesn't, oh, now you can just see that. <laughs> hmm. Oh, I froze for a second, it looks like. Can everyone see me now? OK, good, great. OK. Here, here we go. I'll introduce all of this in just a second. Um, hi, I'm Zelly Martin. As Inga mentioned, I work for the Propaganda Lab at the Center for Media Engagement at UT Austin. And um, again, I just want to say thank you so much for joining on Friday morning. And thank you to Inga for facilitating. I'm um, really excited to be part of this panel. It's a really important topic. Um, so as part of a uh, quite a large research team at the Center for Media Engagement, I've been working for the past year on studying encrypted messaging apps and looking specifically at political propaganda and disinformation on these apps, although we also look at digital activism as well. Um, we've done this all across the globe. So we've been conducting qualitative interviews virtually in um, Eastern Europe, North America, Asia, um, Africa, and the Middle East. And so we've gathered um, quite a bit of information about how political propaganda spreads differently in these countries. And as Inga said today, I'll be talking to you all about who designs, builds, and launches propaganda campaigns on EMAs, and also how these campaigns break through the private spaces of encrypted messaging apps and into public discourse and journalism. Um, just a quick note, when we're talking about EMAs today, we, um, Inga briefly introduced this, but we'll be talking about some EMAs that are fully end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, like Signal, and then some that offer end-to-end -end encryption um, or offer encryption but aren't um, always encrypted, like Telegram. And our interviewees spoke on a variety of chat apps, um, everything from Signal, Viber, Telegram, to Facebook Messenger, and of course, WhatsApp. So um, to start to answer toward our first question, which is who designs and builds and launches these propaganda campaigns, um, I have broadly four main groups of actors um, to tell you about today that, that launch these campaigns. So first of all, we have the state um, and state actors themselves. Then we also have hired propagandists. These are often hired by third parties so that the state can um, have this like semblance of separation. Um, there's also these freelance actors who tend to not be paid, but they still um, are cognizant of the fact that they're spreading disinformation and political propaganda. And then finally, just regular citizens who um, are often spreading misinformation unknowingly uh, that can still prop up the state. Um, for the sake of time, you'll see I've chosen just a couple of examples for each group, but um, it's important to note that I'm not characterizing the entire country or saying that this only happens in these countries. Um, basically, these, these groups are represented in every country that we studied um, from America to Morocco, and so it's important to, um, to say, too, that these are just some, some really great examples, but they happen all across the globe. So in many cases, we heard about the state uh, directly using EMAs to spread political propaganda. Um, we spoke to some people in Duterte's communications office in the Philippines who said, um, we use Facebook Messenger to blast information to the public. And they also showed us some Viber chats with um, a couple of million citizens in them where they would focus on spreading positive information about Duterte and other people we spoke to um, in the country specifically characterize this as political propaganda. Um, so that's a great example of how it's, you know, directly state actors who are using um, EMAs to, to push out positive information and a lot of the time disinformation 
um, it just to prop up this state. But we did also hear about um, propagandists who were hired by third parties, but ended up propping up the state as well. Um, someone who uh, worked for the BJP in India said to us, most of the propaganda that happens from any of the political parties doesn't happen on official accounts. Um, so instead, they will hire PR firms and um, other types of third parties. Oh, it says participants can now see my screen. I hope, hopefully you can see it. <laughs> um, and so they would hire these uh, third party actors. Um, similarly, we heard in Indonesia, there are teams to handle that, um, creating messages to distribution on WhatsApp, for example. Um, so then again, these freelancers, as I mentioned earlier, are um, interviewees that characterize these people as those who knowingly spread disinformation and propaganda, but um, do so just of their own accord um, for nothing. And in Ethiopia, we spoke to um, several people who told us about one man um, who creates these sort of independent think tanks um, that look like legitimate, um, legitimate operations, but are actually just political propaganda machines. And some people said he knows exactly what he's doing. Some people said he didn't, but um, the point of the think tank is to prop up the Ethiopian and Eritrean government. And um, as far as we can tell, he's actually not hired to do this and he just does it um, because he believes in the message. And we heard something similar in Myanmar as well um, about these pro-military telegram groups. Um, they're actually associated with the government, but we can't say exactly how. They're like these pro-military groups and they're very clear about that, but it's not clear um, if they've been paid or if they are actually hired by the state. And then finally, of course, we have regular citizens who are unknowingly or unintentionally spreading propaganda on EMAs, um, especially on WhatsApp is one that we heard about quite a bit. Uh, many of the people we spoke to said that chat apps alongside open social media are the main sources of news, which um, can be really good for getting legitimate information out there and can be really problematic and lead to a lot of disinformation floating around. Um, in Morocco, someone told us we have large numbers in Morocco who only get the news from WhatsApp, and this is something that was pervasive across many of the countries. Um, which brings me to our second question, how does it spread? How does it get into public discourse and, and why does it spread? Um, a big reason behind why the spread of disinformation into public discourse is so pervasive is because of the relevance of trust in these communities. They're often you know, small groups of people who know each other where this information can spread um, really rampantly and people think that because they're getting it from a friend or a community member that it's very trustworthy. Um, and as I mentioned, it's somewhere that a lot of political news spreads. Um, we were also told though about coordinated breakthroughs. So in Ukraine, for instance, um, there are Russian propagandists who will join uh, telegram channels of Ukrainian journalists and then spread propaganda. And this might get picked up first by fringe media, but then it begins to spread from fringe media to social media to mainstream media. Um, and that's one way that it gets just slowly planted, you know, propaganda into the general news. Um, it's important to note too, that when we did these interviews in Ukraine, it was 2021. So it was before uh, the invasion, but this is something that they, said happened even at that time. Um, interestingly, it also goes the other way though. So it's not just coordinated breakthroughs from EMAs into public discourse, but also public discourse and news comes into EMAs to help support and spread political propaganda and disinformation. In um, India, another um, employee at the BJP um, IT firm said um, that they'll take what's most engaging in the newspapers and what's um, getting the most traction and then pull that into EMAs and then that can help build their support base and um, create these new networks where there are big communities of really engaged citizens who are then people that they can distribute political propaganda and disinformation to. Um, this is also something 
that we heard about in other countries as well. Um, in Mexico, for instance, some people told us that they'll take op-eds that were published that day and they'll reproduce them exclusively, explicitly the same in EMAs. And then they'll just change the final paragraphs to spread disinformation and propaganda. So it looks like real news, but then it is turned into um, disinformation. And then finally, of course, um, again, I just wanted to hit on that these are trusted sources, which is why they have um, so much success spreading disinformation. Um, and journalists in Ukraine told us that one of the reasons why disinformation is so easily accepted when it's received from Viber is, is because it's people you personally know and you personally trust, and they will rely on trusted sources. So they may say things like, I got this information from a sister of a doctor in a voice note. And then that allows the information to spread um, pretty rampantly because it's coming from someone that you think you know and you think you trust. However, I will just end on this can also um, be really positive for activism. These same kinds of strategies can be used and I'm gonna let Dima speak more to that, but um, someone we spoke to in Myanmar told us that what they'll do is coordinate on Telegram and coordinate on Signal and then they will spread their um, activism and spread real information into more open social media like Twitter and Facebook. So um, these strategies aren't only used by you know, bad actors, they are also used by activists and can be used for good. But I will go ahead and turn it over to Dima and let her talk more about that. And then I look forward to answering questions about propaganda after. Um, thank you so much, Sally. Uh, that was also very informative. And thank you for this amazing presentation. Um, OK, so um, I think if we want to speak about, you know, how these encrypted applications and private applications have been used for organizing and mobilizing, um, and I'm speaking here specifically about the context of the Middle East, North Africa, because basically we had, you know, um, the so-called Arab Spring in 2011, and this is basically the period where we see people turning more to using apps, to especially that, the ones that use end-to-end -end encryption. Um, so I think when it comes to encrypted and private applications, um, these have uh, long been the preferred tool for activists and human rights defenders, but also for journalists uh, seeking to secure lines of communications. Um, for many protests and revolutions across the Middle East and North Africa that ignited during the so-called Arab Spring, uh, we have also seen people organizing over um, uh, Telegram, for example, over Signal and more specifically over WhatsApp. Of course, there are some other social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, uh, but again, um, it's, it was the activists who use these tools as a way to organize and mobilize, but these tools were not basically created for that specific purpose. Um, and when it comes to encrypted messaging apps, um, these have actually uh, facilitated um, activist movements and outreach to connect uh, with the wider public and basically to um, support uh, political movements and to aid revolutions as well, um, especially for activists seeking, you know, uh, to move more towards democrat uh, democratization. And this is exactly why, you know, the um, different events or the sort called Arab Spring you know, can, as people want um, to have a different phase towards more democratization. And basically we didn't have the tools or, um, you know, channels of communication where we have secure applications to communicate and organize. Um, so protesters basically um, have been seeking means um, to communicate and to coordinate among themselves uh, without authorities being able um, to listen and to disrupt basically their activities. Um, so it was a way to evade authorities. This is why basically people were using these sort of tools. But on the other hand, um, I mean, when Zeli mentioned the bad actors, we also have some other bad actors like the governments, unfortunately, and the authorities in the region. Um, so basically, the governments were also um, attempting to use um, the same channels that people use during organizing and mobilizing, also to use that against them and to prevent them from protesting, um, and as well to limit their, you know, um, 
critical mass reach to other people and to you know get more people joining these movements. Um, so that's why after you know during that period during after 2011 around that timeline, we have seen governments introducing some um, policies and legislations uh, to weaken the encryption and especially the use of encrypted uh, apps uh, such as Signal, you know, Telegram and um, other communications like WhatsApp. Um, so in Tunisia, for example, we have seen how the use of encryption um, it's not currently criminalized, but there was a draft law that emerged in 2018, and it has over 400 provisions. And one of them was criminalizing encryption. Um, and basically, this is now regulated under the telecommunication code, but um, the criminalizing of encryption uh, was under the new digital code. So fortunately, there have been some efforts by local civil society organizations in Tunisia, and they were able to push back against that. Um, so eventually the ICT ministry uh, withdrew that um, you know, proposal about the criminalizing of encryption. But to date, we still don't know if you know, this would come up again. We have no idea where the draft law is, and we don't know if encryption will be criminalized again. Um, I mean, the, the, the other case, which is, I think, more worse, it's in Egypt. And um, so under the problematic uh, cybercrime law, for example, uh, encryption, um, it's illegal and punishable also by imprisonment to use encryption. Um, and the authorities say if you use encryption for inciting violence, for example, or if you use it for uh, threatening public safety or, um, for example, discrimination, but this absolutely has no clear definition under the law what they mean by that. So basically they use this against people to target them and uh, basically if they um, you know when they target human rights activists who are using such tools and apps they can use very loose concepts against them under the cyber crime law and this is one of the things they use when we when they find people using encrypted apps um, I think the situation is even worse in Syria because um, the uh, regulator, uh, the service providers who are also, you know, and uh, will be in charge of providing license when people uh, want to use encryption or, you know, any sort of services that use encryption in the, in the country. Um, the service providers are actually equipped with technical capabilities uh, to decrypt uh, encrypted communications. So this means that, you know, um, the reach of these authorities is increasing more and more because they understood how people use these tools and products during uh, critical times to organize themselves. And now they are using these exactly apps against them. So um, we have seen other examples where, for example, the United Arab Emirates created their own um, um, government approved platform and they say it's also into encrypted encryption uh, but this uh, platform called TukTok and uh, there have been some reports saying that this actually had been used as a mass surveillance against people who downloaded that app so sometimes encryption can you know be used also against the people and could be um, um, you know a tool to expand again the government's reach and authoritarian authoritarian re uh, reach in, in the country. Um, some other countries have also turned to completely ban some of these applications. So in Egypt, in Oman, in United Arab Emirates, uh, for example, Signal was blocked. And in Egypt, it was uh, more specifically banned during the 2011 uh, uh, revolutions or protests. So um, I think also when we speak about this issue from a regional lens, we can't you know, um, turn a blind eye to the debate where government would say, but wait, um, you know, we think encryption can also can actually be a used and effective tool uh, to counter terrorism and to control the spread of terrorism acts, you know, and these kind of thoughts on these applications. But I think uh, when it comes to this issue, I think this debate is really, um, it's, you know, I, I don't think it's acceptable because um, when it comes to this issue, it's very disproportionate. It doesn't mean that people who know, you know, the, the platforms that could be used to spread extremism um, thoughts, they can turn to other platforms. They can, you know, buy that from the uh, dark net, for example, or they can use other platforms in foreign jurisdictions. So there is different, you know, options for these people who 
do these criminal acts. And you can't actually criminalize all the people who are using encryption uh, applications into encryption for you know, there is a small proportion of these people who conduct criminal act, but you are punishing the whole people, you know, everyone who's trying to use these applications. Um, and I remember uh, there was a case when ISIS uh, used um, Telegram, you know, to uh, spread some radical ideas and uh, to recruit people as well. Uh, but that, again, doesn't mean that these applications um, it means that um, these groups will exist on these platforms and will continue to do so. Um, so this is absolutely not the solution. Um, so overall, I just want to end this saying that, um, you know, um, these um, encrypted and uh, private apps are very important, especially for human rights activists and the human rights defenders organizing themselves. And um, in the context of the Arab region as well, I think it, these apps also offer a vital access to unrestricted information that we really need, especially in lack of access to information and with the ongoing crackdown and repression on human rights activists in the region. Um, so yeah, um, um, I would love you know, to continue uh, this discussion, but um, I am also uh, would love to hear from Azza what she thinks about the role of private companies and the structure. Thank you. As a, um, maybe before we come to you, I'd quickly mm -hmm. chime in. Uh, thank you both, Sally and Dima. This was super interesting, super informative. And it's just, it's kind of fascinating to see what happens to platforms or apps, you know, that were designed with a purpose, but then what do people around the world in different contexts like make out of them? I have one quick follow-up, um, Dima on all sorts like you gave us a really interesting overview and uh, mentioned some of those repressive like either legislative attempts or existing legislation and obviously one big one is also this iran online um safety bill which like has passed yet and things but has some some pretty repressive additional measures in it, like banning VPNs, for example. And my question is actually just quickly, when you follow these legislative attempts, what are usually the rationales around it? Do regimes rely on a national security discourse? Are there other aspects that they um, cite when they like, you know, argue for the need of this type of legislation? What is it in your experience that they emphasize? Yeah, so I think um, it's, I don't think they, sometimes I think there might be specific events where these legislations emerge, but sometimes like in the case of Tunisia, there hasn't been something like specific events in 2018 and, but the country was basically following um, a similar law actually that was introduced in France. So the digital code in Tunisia was basically a copycat of the French law. So I think sometimes this is what most governments do in the region. There is sometimes the rationale would be, you know, there is a specific events, there is a protest or there is elections, let's say, in a way. So uh, during the critical events, they would turn to introduce legislations because, um, you know, they know that this would be the only way to criminalize people, to put them in jails. Um, and again, the fines and um, even the punishment, the imprisonments, uh, you know, um, jails under these laws, these are very harsh penalties. Um, so, it, you know, it, I mean, the purpose basically is to criminalize the user, but I, I don't think this, you know, should be, um, I mean, the governments could turn to other solutions. They could also, um, you know, have sort of consultations when they introduce these laws, but I don't think in most countries they actually involve civil society or experts in this area to discuss more with them. What does it mean for encryption? Why is encryption important? I think they are using it again against us in a way. Um, so this is, um, I mean, how I have observed it from my experience. Okay, super interesting. Thank you. Um, so I've been told that we should have, like we submitted polls in advance and they should be available in um, the live stream platform. So I think in your chat function, if everyone who has joined this panel, if you could take I probably will take a minute or so to answer those polls. That would be super interesting because we'd like to get some input via these polls from all of you. And then maybe later when we do more Q&A, we can also rely on those um, numbers or the output of those polls to get additional ideas what people might be interested in or what their 
dealing with. So the three questions that we submitted are, do you think encryption on EMAs is secure, is secure in the country you work or live? So this is, <clears throat> and this is obviously a question that is less directed towards like the technical um, differences that Zeddy like briefly touched upon, like the ad signal is more secure, for instance, than Telegram, especially if you don't enable the end to end um, or use channels or something. But the question is a bit more also towards perception because we came across and um, we came across like insights as well, where even though signal might be more secure simply because the government, the secret police, whatever, is so pervasive in a country that people wouldn't trust any app anymore. So what about the country that you work or live in? Like if you use your encrypted messaging app, do you think it's secure or not? And um, if you use an encrypted messaging app, then the second question is, have you come across misinformation on these apps? So have you received something that was certainly false information? Or yeah, did you receive a news article which pretty much looked like propaganda but was forwarded to you from XYZ? which leads us to the second question, um, who has sent you the misinformation? Like maybe some of you use only one app, chat app and only use it for private communication and one-on-one -on -one chats with friends, then it's unlikely or less likely that you came across misinformation. But I think what we've encountered last year is actually a small battle playing out also on these encrypted messaging apps from various sides. So we've been interested in knowing um, who sent you the misinformation? Was it friends, family, government actors, journalists? Um, also, obviously, depends what your own background is, maybe. So you should be able to fill out those polls um, now and maybe even for the next minute or so. And then hopefully we will get the results in a couple of minutes and we can touch upon that later in the Q&A. And again, also, if you have questions for either Dima or Zeli so far or general topics you would want to bring into the session, you can put them in the chat function. And then as it would be great to hear from you as well. Great. Thank you so much. And I learned so much from both of you, Zeli and Dima. Um, Dima, especially in terms of, in relation to terrorist and violent content, uh, policies, you know, TVEC uh, policies, we, we see a lot of that in the region, uh, both especially in regards to encrypted messaging apps and Telegram, and the question of deplatforming becomes central uh, uh, in regards to dangerous organizations, or what they call dangerous organizations. Uh, so I just want to reframe this discussion as I talk about content moderation. So as we think about the different opportunities and issues that have plagued EMAs enumerated by my previous panel members, I think it's important to center our understanding of content moderation on end-to-end -end messaging apps along two axes. Uh, first, safeguarding privacy and two, reducing harm. So as Dima previously noted, EMAs have become important and invaluable spaces for marginalized groups, human rights defenders, journalists, NGOs, and other stakeholders to mobilize, organize, and create spaces of care on these apps, primarily because of the inability of malicious actors, government officials, and corporations to encroach on their privacy. Uh, the operational structures um, of messaging apps like WhatsApp, Telegram, and Signal have also um, made it difficult to provide anonymity as a safeguard for queer folks and victims of abuse, since access to these spaces is granted to phone numbers, which in numerous countries are tied to one's IDs and passports. Uh, this is at least the case in Lebanon where I'm from and where I'm speaking from right now, um, uh, instead of usernames, for example. But one EMA that comes to mind that does provide this option is Wired, and I know that Signal is working on uh, this feature right now. But the problem with usernames also comes with uh, comes with questions about um, in this discussion that in order to safeguard individuals' uh, identities. Uh, their safety and their free speech, which is 
the most important thing, content moderation in the classical sense must be reframed and rethought within the context of encrypted messaging apps. So content moderation as we see it now on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok emphasizes a balancing act between tech and government oversight. So what I mean by this is that tech companies whose policies leave us wanting in the global south, as both Zeli and Dina have spoke about, must scramble to adapt to lawmakers largely from the global north, whose policies, while meant to tackle serious issues of abuse, run the risk of ostracizing and endangering the majority of platform users. So as Dima talked about, um, Tunisia mimicking legislation from Paris, from France, in regards to digital communication and uh, encryption, we see this happening all across, not just the MENA region, but also in Latin America, in APAC, in Africa. And Rightscon this year has focused a lot on this issue. So I don't want to go a bit further into it, but I do want to uh, uh, focus on the, that any consideration of content moderation on encrypted messaging apps should not be bound by this dynamic because we risk compromising our privacy, which will yield unfathomable, unfathom, unfathomable consequences on the rights of the groups that need these messaging apps the most. So instead, moderation on encrypted messaging apps should emphasize user agency, strengthen and elucidate on intentionally designed reporting mechanisms that take into account its most vulnerable stakeholders, experiences not as edge cases or outliers, but as the baseline, and communicate effectively and transparency disclosures and policies. Right now, if you go on WhatsApp's uh, webpage, you do not know what their community policies are. You can find some tidbits on their privacy policy, but you don't actually know exactly how and under what conditions is reporting, uh, take, uh, like violating content actually violating. Um, and Signal does not moderate, it is not interested to moderate content, mainly because the operational structure of Signal is very different to WhatsApp, where parts of the encrypted messaging apps and the metadata is saved on WhatsApp servers. So Signal does not save anything. So it is unable, uh, as of now, to moderate content, even though there has been um, concerns about uh, the use of Signal for um, uh, human rights violations and issues of abuse. And Telegram in itself has had a shoddy history in terms of its ownership, in terms of its uh, moderation and what it values in terms of uh, um, its users and moderation. So I, I don't know if right now we are able to think about uh, content moderation within the approach that we're looking for. So I hope we're able to see platforms that in general, the future, I hope that we're able to see platforms that understand, uh, valorize and valorize the labor of fact-checking organizations, individuals and human rights defenders that painstakingly try to make these encrypted messaging apps safe, conducive spaces of mobilization, organization and mutual aid. But presently, we are nowhere near this approach. Recent EU legislation that proposes giving access to government and law enforcement agencies to individuals' messages effectively breaks encryption under the guise of battling child sex abuse, even though previous studies have shown that these approaches do more harm than good and will certainly lead to increased surveillance. So if Dima was talking about our use as Arab and Arab activists of uh, encrypted messaging apps to uh, evade surveillance, with this legislation, this will no longer be the case. We know that the UAE, we know that Egypt, we know that Bahrain, and to a certain extent, Lebanon and Saudi Arabia have access to surveillance uh, technology and spyware technology that can, break, can, that can break encryption. And legislation like this will um, uh, will um, 
sort of mainstream and render this acceptable under the guise of child sex abuse. Um, um, and this will lead, and the most people who will be harmed are queer, feminists and human rights activists, as well as journalists and NGO workers in countries where their work, where their very work has already been threatened through draconian legislation. So take, for example, Tunisia and Egypt. I know we've been talking a lot about Tunisia and Egypt, but in Tunisia, a coup orchestrated by President Kai Saeed has done away with judicial independence, uh, dissolved the government, and has threatened Tunisian civil society with the enactment of a draconian law that would impose further restrictions on NGOs' activities and funding, similar to legislation that was also previously passed in Egypt in 2019. So there is a, there is a push, um, an autocratic push to criminalize and surveil uh, the works of folks that have been doing, that a lot of them actually are at SiteCon right now, uh, and that may be watching this, uh, this panel um, and whose lives and work is important. Um, and we are not at the, not at the uh, ideal approach to content or thinking about content moderation on encrypted messaging apps in the way that we need to. But at the same time, I find it important to spotlight the labor of contracted content moderation workers that continuously filter reported abusive and graphic content, especially on WhatsApp, for low pay, no benefits, and very little guidance. The discussion around contracted Como workers has largely focused on platforms' unwillingness to invest enough resources to strengthen these teams, instead of thinking about ways to optimize their work. Human moderation is, is essential to any argument about effective, contextually driven content uh, to a contextually driven content moderation approach. Unfortunately, algorithmic moder uh, moderation inflated success has swayed government officials uh, to encourage its development and wide adoption, despite its numerous evidence leveled by researchers and civil society actors in the global south about its drawbacks in tackling very violations in non-Western languages. So I guess this is like a big, uh, I went through a lot of things very quickly, but I guess I'd like to end my spiel by offering a question for everyone that's joined us today. What kind of agency do you wish you have on an encrypted messaging app? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Aza. Um, and I think that is a super important question almost to like carry with you whenever you use an app like this, hopefully also for people who develop apps like this. Just a quick follow-up. Um, I think your input was like uh, super interesting and also quite convincing. Um, is there... Are there, um, is there like content that is more prevalent maybe on these uh, apps versus other social media platforms that in addition to all of the problems you outlined that uh, could or like that would come up if um, content moderation, other legislation to gain access to EMAs is introduced? Like, so in other words, like, for instance, audio video messages, like how could they even be moderated? Like, yeah. Yeah, so actually, in terms of audio and video, um, what Facebook does, it has a hash and meta analysis system, so metadata system um, that it also has on WhatsApp. Uh, so there is a hashing system in terms of analyzing the metadata of, of the data, which means, so metadata means the data of the data. Um, so it gives an indication not of the content itself, but of um, its, its um, similarities or the virality of this object or of this piece of content. So questions around audio and video become very difficult and becomes, I think, we need to um, be uh, situated within the question of user agency and user knowledge of reporting mechanisms uh, which is also very lacking because most people don't know that you can report messages on WhatsApp. They don't know that 
um, you have the, some kind of power uh, when on an encrypted messaging app. I hope that answered yeah. your question. Yeah, definitely. And it's also a super interesting point and something that is always kind of on my mind with the encrypted messaging apps, but also with other, like with social media in general, how to, yeah, how to like gain or how to convey as much understanding to as many people as possible what actually their agency already is, right? That's also sometimes um, sometimes uh, a thing. There's always room for improvement, but also how can you make information such as transparency reports or something um, actually accessible or reach many people. Um, maybe piggybacking up on Aza's idea or questions about agency, Dima, and even putting the owners maybe on the companies a bit more, what, what are policy changes in almost an ideal world or even in our current world that you would like to see um, that could make EMAs even more helpful for activists or at least, yeah, have them continue to be good platforms? Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so I think, um, of course, there is, you know, um, when it comes to companies, how they can ensure that also through their products and, you know, services they provide that, um, you know, the risk to human that's it is mitigated basically. And this is why when we see, I think when it comes to these applications, I know that there's, you know, some efforts about uh, Signal, for example, having um, conversation for uh, many number of people who can join the conversation. It's a, diff a bit different from Telegram, which might be limited to specific number of people. So that might be create an issue, but I think eventually we need to have this um, safe space. We need more features that fit into the local context as well that has uh, touched on when it comes to how we can, um, you know, make also these tools and products more um, adapt to the context of the different regions. But, uh, but also the overall goal is to ensure that this is basically a platform where, where uh, human rights activists and journalists can share information. We need these secure tools. Um, I think it also depends on the sort of coordination that we have with the, um, either the companies that develop the, these tools as well as with governments because we need we need to have this coordination. Um, as I mentioned, there is some emerging legislations that would criminalize encryption. So even if we have the apps, I think there would be an issue with the legislation. So that's why we need also to have more of a coordination efforts between the different you know, actors and um, basically tell our stories, speak about how this issue is uh, making our you know, the future of our region might be even worse if we don't have any sort of secure applications. I remember during, you know, the, again, uh, back in 10 years back, people were saying walls have ears. So we really need now to have this, uh, at least very secure apps. We need uh, even companies when they develop encrypted apps to also organize and coordinate, co uh, consult with civil society as well and uh, with the, these people who use the applications. Um, so this is basically uh, what I hope really to see more coordination, more efforts, and that we can build it together. Uh, because I think this is also an emerging issue. We always learn from what policies we need to incorporate. Um, and I think this would come with consultation with the different stakeholders. Yeah, thank you, Dima. Uh, I think really uh, important points. Um, Zeli, I'm going to pose a question to you that is a bit tricky. So... Yeah, maybe try to answer it. Kind of like going from what Dima said, like, you know, there, there's obviously complexities uh, um, around EMAs, etc. I think maybe a general, um, like a general thing that we should carry with us when we study EMAs, for instance, how can we avoid the simplistic discourse about it's either good or it's either bad? Um, yeah, thoughts? Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. It is tricky. I think that, um, you know, uh, one thing that I even did in my own um, presentation uh, that I, um, you know, clearly need to work on is referred to some people as bad actors. And I did use air quotes, but still, I think um, even just changing our language, our you know, language and how we refer to people um, is something that is important. I mean, there's um, you know, I, I would 
there are many governments, um, for example, the, um, you know, the regime in Myanmar that I would basically characterize as bad actors um, and not really feel a, a lot of, of qualms about saying that. However, um, I still think that um, in that particular case, it's a really great example of how encryption is like this um, really challenging, nuanced um, feature because people are getting a ton of disinformation in encrypted channels. And it's also almost the only way that people can access um, legitimate news and real information, um, which, you know, Dima and Asa have both spoken to. And so um, when, at least as, as researchers, I think when we're writing up these reports, um, it's really important to to put both of those in there. And it's hard because we obviously want to have a clear argument one way or another, right? But I think it's really important to say there's, you know, it's it's integral to have for activism. And also it's not like you can just trust every piece of information that you receive on EMAs. Um, and similarly, I would say um, it's, it's really important to have qualitative work on this topic um, when academics are doing this research because, um, just, you know, quantitative work and being able to see the breadth is really, really important. But at the same time, if we don't dive in and speak to individual people and figure out the nuance in their personal experiences of EMAs um, and really give them that agency in the conversation, then I think that we will lose the nuance in, in this um, basically debate about whether it's good or not. So in short, I would say qualitative work and also just leaving all the nuance in, even though it makes a muddier argument. <laughs> yeah, nuance is so important. And at the same time, yes, it's often difficult to convey, basically. Thank you, Zeli. I know we only have, I think, five more minutes to go. So this might be our last question. But I want to drive, like, I want to push you guys a bit on a topic that that was like mentioned in multiple RightsCon panels. And I think that is something that is really important for us, like the exploitation of technologies, like in our case, social media, or these apps by actually powerful actors, like by authoritarian governments, individuals in those. And I've came a lot of frustration in other, I came across a lot of frustration in other RightsCon panels by activists either in the countries, but also in the diaspora saying, we can witness our account being shut down, my content being taken down uh, in instances. And then at the same time, you have this paradox or hypocrisy, for instance, with regard to Iran, to have uh, people like Ahmadinejad running Twitter accounts, even though Twitter is banned. Um, so this is, this is an unfair treatment. So how can we maybe put pressure or how can we take either policymakers in Western countries or the tech companies themselves kind of put some responsibility on them or hold them accountable to, yeah, to remove themselves from this hypocrisy. I know it's like a really big ask, but for all three of you, maybe final points on, on that. And then we probably need to wrap up. I can go first. My uh, my answer is very to the point. It's um, and it's entail. It's not an easy answer, but it's rooted in the business model. The only reason the reason why Ahmadinejad is on Twitter, but everyone else is banned, is because he can bring in so many views, and that's that's profitable for Twitter. So it's all um, it's it all gets it all has to do with the business model. So in my opinion, um, once you've uh, done away with a business model that profits off misinformation, uh, um, abuse, harassment, uh, and incitement, um, as well as other things, then you have a space um, on the internet um, and communities where you can uh, speak your mind without fear. You can feel inclusive, included, and um, everyone has possibly an equal voice. That's how I think about it. I see Dima and Zeli nodding. Do you have something to add? Uh, I, I'll just say that I um, I second what Asa says. I think that's an excellent point, and I don't know that I have another. Um, 
another recommendation only to, yeah, just to say, I agree with you. I think that um, we're in a position now where our platforms are fundamentally um, geared towards profiting off of misinformation and um, engagement in any way possible and especially negative engagement. And so until we make some change in that direction, then um, I would say there's, uh, you know, that it's, it's fundamentally flawed. And I think that the platforms are doing exactly what they were built to do. And we should stop acting like um, they were built for good and they've been corrupted by the populations. Um, they were they were doing what they were built for. And so we need to rebuild, <laughs> I would say. Um, I also agree. I, um, of course, echo what Hazza and Zeli said. Um, I think it's with the business model and um, if there is no hate speech, no disinformation or misinformation circulating, I think the, the platform will shut <laughs> down, you know, so they are basically profiting off from this. Um, but I think documentation of these cases when they occur are very important. Um, so always we have to track and monitor whatever happens on this social media so we can hold them to accountable. Um, we need more transparency, of course. And I think it's to start by documentation of cases of takedown or when it does similar to what Azza mentioned. So if we can also work on the documentation, I think we can definitely hold them to accountable and drive a change in that industry. Okay, thank you guys so much. Um, I really appreciate this uh, honest conversation. I don't think the challenges um, will go away. Like there are many technologies who can be used for uh, different reasons and your input was super valuable. I just had a quick glance at our poll results and um, there are some positive news in that that many people still think that EMAs are safe in the country they use it. So that I think puts emphasis actually really uh, on the tech companies and on policymakers to think about which legislation they enact where and what can be the consequences around the world. I think we have one more minute, so I really need to wrap it up. Um, we like, um, I think we'll do a write up of the session. We'll definitely coordinate with RightsCon what could be an output of this. Um, but your input was much appreciated. Thank you for the people who responded to the poll and for everyone dialing in on this last day of RightsCon. Have a good Friday and good weekend.